This is the story of Jerry Rawlings, the military leader turned Democrat who dominated political life in Ghana throughout the 1980s and 90s. Rawlings emerged on the political scene in 1979 through a coup d'etat as a junior officer who led the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council and eventually consolidated his rule as a legitimate democratically elected president of Ghana under the Fourth Republican Constitution in 1992. Ghana's political history cannot be complete without an examination of the role that Jerry Rawlings played in that country. So in this episode of African Biographics, we look at a brief history of Jerry John Rawlings. Born in Accra, Ghana on 22 June 1947, Jerry Rawlings was the son of a Scottish farmer and a Ghanaian mother. As a boy, Jerry Rawlings attended Achimota Secondary School, Ghana's elite school boasting notable alumni such as Ghana's first president, Kwame Nkrumah, and Gambia's first president, Seda Dawada Jawara. Rawlings' contemporaries are of the views that his qualities as a leader showed from an early age. He would not tolerate bullying and he readily came to the defense of any underdog who was mistreated by his or her classmates. Rawlings had since early childhood been preconceived with the idea that people in authority should portray the highest standards of integrity. This point is important for what will follow later on in the video. After completing his studies, he entered the Ghanaian Military Academy in 1968 and rose to the ranks of Flight Lieutenant by 1978. Around this time, at the helm in Ghana was a military government following the overthrow of Kwame Nkrumah's administration. Ghana was experiencing food shortages and economic stagnation and the nation's citizens were disgruntled. The increasingly politically active and popular Jerry Rawlings used this swelling energy in the country to support his first coup d'etat attempt in 1979, alleging mass corruption of the military government for declining living standards. Jerry Rawlings burst onto the international scene in 1979 when the pencil slim Air Force pilot staged a coup against the ruling military government, which was thoroughly corrupt, oppressive, and ran the country with gross mismanagement. But the staging of the coup by Jerry Rawlings, which owed more to emotion than carefully thought out plans, initially failed. Jerry Rawlings was arrested, tried, and sentenced to death. All along this whole process, he had built up a good deal of support amongst the suffering masses and news of the death sentence sent a shiver of unease among the people. So it did not come as a great surprise that he was rescued from jail by his adoring fellow junior officers. After being released, riding a tank, he cornered the head of state, General Fred Akufo, and deposed him from power. This uprising was met with joy and enthusiasm by most Ghanaians. Rawlings then took charge of the newly established Armed Forces Revolutionary Council and assured the people that they intended to hand power back to civilians after a necessary house cleaning exercise. The new military government tried to clear up corruption in all walks of life, especially the so-called Kalabule system, which was the name of the black or parallel market that had affected the cost of living and which the state suspected to be responsible for the spiraling inflation in Ghana. The military council also promised people that the officials of the former regime would be made accountable for their actions. They were tried and former heads of state generals Fred Akufo, Akwasi Afrifa and Ignatius Achempong were executed. This was followed by a purge of judges and other military officers who were accused of corruption and many were executed. On the other hand, Rawlings kept his promise to turn power over to a civilian government. Elections were held in September of 1979, and Dr. Hila Liman was voted into the presidency. Rawlings returned to the military and his duties as a flight lieutenant. Tensions soon developed between the Liman administration and Jerry Rawlings. As the Ghanaian economy continued deteriorating, Rawlings put pressure on the government, declaring himself a guardian of the revolution he had initiated in June of 1979. In response, the Lehman administration forced Rawlings to resign his military commission and kept the charismatic leader under close surveillance, even detaining Rawlings at one point on the grounds that he was planning another coup. Convinced that the new civilian rulers would not be able to reverse Ghana's declining standard of living, Rawlings initiated another coup d'etat. 
Flight Lieutenant Rawlings, still in uniform and seething in the background, ceased power again on December 31, 1981. He arrested President Hila Lehman and most of his aides and dissolved the parliament. Mr. Rawlings told his countrymen that the country was in ruins. The government, he said, had turned hospitals into graveyards and clinics into death transit camps where men, women and children died daily because of the lack of drugs and basic equipment. He cited poor economic management of the state as the primary reason for the coup, noting Ghana's spiraling foreign deaths, inflation rising above 100% and growing civil unrest. It was even reported that most hotels were urging guests to bring their own soap, towels, soft drinks and sometimes even food. As I mentioned earlier, after the second coup, Jerry Rawlings dissolved the parliament and he even declared opposition parties illegal. Rawlings then founded and led a provisional National Defense Council that would serve as the country's only political party. Jerry Rawlings PNDC adopted Marxist principles to try and stem the economic bleeding, but the communist policies were rejected by the majority and criticism of the government began to rise. Rawlings administration introduced workers' councils to oversee the country's factories, workers' defense committees sprang up in every community, and Rawlings turned to the Soviet Union for support. Between 1983 and 1987, Rawlings survived five coup attempts. In an effort to try and curb the increasingly unstable and volatile political situation in the country, Rawlings clamped down on all opposition, something he later indicated that he deeply regretted and many activists and even journalists were imprisoned and some were tortured. This government-sanctioned clampdown outraged human rights campaigners around the world. By 1983, Ghana was close to collapse. Food supplies were unpredictable, production levels were at an all-time low, expenditure on health in real terms was one quarter of what it had been in 1976, medical facilities were unavailable, Infant mortality had risen from 80 deaths per thousand to around 120 deaths per thousand in seven years. Roads were impassable and inflation had reached 123%. When the failure of the populist measures had become clear by 1983, and perhaps sensing that the Soviet bloc was on the verge of collapse, Rawlings reversed course to embrace the free market. So as a result, the Rawlings administration implemented some belt tightening measures including dropping subsidies and price controls in order to reduce inflation, privatizing many state-owned companies including its vitally important coffee and cocoa plantations, and also devaluing the currency in order to stimulate exports. These free market measures sharply revived Ghana's economy, which by the early 1990s had one of the highest growth rates in Africa. During his time in power, Jerry Rawlings was bending slowly towards this country's long transformation into a democratic state. He did away with a ban on political parties in May of 1992, and six months later, Ghana held an election which Jerry Rawlings won without difficulty in a vote judged fair by outside observers. This was the first presidential election held in Ghana since 1979, and Rawlings was chosen as the president of the country. He was later re-elected in 1996, and this was thanks mainly to the country's newfound economic stability. At the end of his term in 2001, he stepped down from power, and when his nominated successor, John Attermuse, lost the election to opposition leader John Kufour, Rawlings pledged his full support to the new leader. He had therefore overseen Ghana's transition to a modern democratic state and it was the first time in Ghana's history that a sitting government peacefully transferred power to an elected member of the opposition. Jerry John Rawlings died on 12 November 2020 at Kolebu Teaching Hospital in Accra, the capital of Ghana. This was a week after having been admitted for a short illness. Some reports state that his death was caused by complications from COVID-19. Jerry John Rawlings left behind a complicated legacy of both violence and democracy. He is credited with stabilizing Ghana's turbulent politics and the economy, and leaving a legacy of democracy after having been in power for 20 years. His critics, however, blame him for the instability which followed his 1979 coup. While seen as a champion of the poor and a fighter against corruption, 
political opponents also accused Jerry Rawlings' administration of being intolerant of dissent, while human rights campaigners were outraged at the arrest and imprisonment of opposition leaders. Let me know in the comment section below what your thoughts are on the life and legacy of Jerry Rawlings. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been Tatenda for African Biographics. Until next time, cheers. Have a good one.